Good morning, church. There's an insert in your bulletin. It says um, sermon notes for October. Uh, I would appreciate you jotting down your observations concerning the congregation rebels that we will be discussing and reading about in our, in our sermon and about Moses, God, and the sons of Korah uh, and children of Korah. Uh, write these observations down and then sometime today, get with somebody else and discuss it. I think that this is gonna be profitable. And also make sure you write down your takeaways. This is just not something just to do. It's something that should have good input, input into our life. For those of you who have one of the Bibles from the back, uh, our primary text is found on page 147. I know that my brothers and sisters in Russia would really appreciate me giving you greetings from them. This is one of the traditions of the, the Baptists that we had the privilege of ministering with. At the end of the service, they asked, are there any greetings from another church or an individual? And they share those greetings and they say, return the greetings. It is trying to have the awareness of how large God's family is. So in behalf of the churches that we are familiar with in Russia, I send you their greetings. In 2 Timothy 3.16, we read, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And so we're planning to take a look at a story tucked away in the book of Numbers. It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. It's the fourth book in the Bible, chapter 16. So a little bit of introduction. We have often heard that God chose Israel. Yes, and much more. Israel was not a people until God chose a man, Abraham. God called him to leave his family and, a, and country to a place where God would show him. He obeyed and went, not knowing where he was going. God said that he would make him a great nation, and in him all the families of the earth would be blessed. Along with this awesome promise and others was a sobering prophecy recorded in the book of Genesis chapter 15, verse 13 to 16, I read. And he, God, said to Abram, know for surety that your seed or descendants shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them for 400 years. Also that nation whom they serve I will judge and afterwards they shall come out with great substance and you shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come back here again. For the iniquity of the Amorites Am Am is not yet full. And now we remember the story of Joseph being sold into slavery. And in time, by the hand of God, he became the second most powerful ruler in Egypt. Um, then after Joseph passed away, Basically, he was forgotten. And so the children of Israel were enslaved for centuries. Then God called a man named Moses to be his ambassador and to deliver Israel from Egypt with powerful signs and wonders. The enslaved Israelis escaped the cruel, depressing bondage, heading to the promised land flowing with milk and honey. They left Egypt with a slave mentality. No education or experience with the responsibilities of decision-making as, as free, um, mature adults. But God is going to make them a great nation to show his glory and power. When the approximately two million Israelis left Egypt, they took with them food and water that would last uh, for a short time. In reality, Years of wandering lay ahead. God miraculously fed the people with nutritional manna, quail, water for 40 years, day after day, faithfully. Their clothing, footwear, and so on did not wear out. And God had meetings with Moses, giving him instructions, laws, rules, 
principles would form this people into a great and viable nation. Fantastic promises were given by God, provided that they would obey and trust God. The laws covered their relationship with the Lord, health, dietary issues, social, agricultural issues, international relationship, civil laws, and on and on. God was assuming full responsibility for this new nation. Their cooperation was vital. Through this nation, God would showcase to the world his greatness and his glory. Before we get to our text, I think we need to recognize that all who came out of Egypt observed the mighty miracles. Now, the text that we'll be reading from in Numbers 16, those folk came out of Egypt. They came out seeing these great signs God did to the Egyptians. They experienced going through the Red Sea. Boy, that was some, some memory, I'm sure. They observed many things. And also, God set up residence as they traveled through the wilderness. There was a cloud in the day and the cloud by fire at nighttime, so God's presence was always showing himself there. But as we come to this particular text, we've already had a number of incidents where Israel was rebellious against the Lord. And so, let's jump into Numbers chapter 16, verse 1. Now Korah, the son of Isar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan, Abiram, and the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. A little bit of background. God had specifically chosen Moses to be the ambassador. And this is something Moses didn't really want. He tried to talk God out of it, but God had chosen him, and so Moses submitted. God was the head provider for and overseer of Israel. God was king, sovereign Lord of Israel. That's what he intended. He was the head. Korah, and we just read about him, was a cousin to Moses and Aaron and was chosen with his relatives to be assistants with specific responsibilities to Aaron and his sons, the priests. In other words, Moses, Aaron, and Kor were all descendants of Levi, the third son of Jacob. God chose Aaron and his descendants to be priests and the rest of the Levites to be assistants to the priests. Got the picture? Then there was three others, Dathan, Byron, On. They were descendants of Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob. Possibly these three assumed they had right to leadership since they were the descendants of the firstborn. That's the best I can come up with is why they were in this rebellion. Regarding the 250 leaders that were renowned, representatives of the congregation, they didn't represent the elders. I think that's significant. So we'll go back. Um, Numbers chapter 16. Now Korah with Dathan, Abiram, and On took men. And they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of, re of renown. And they gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. Why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Now, I think there's a little over 250 seats in here. Can you visualize? There's Moses and Aaron, two, right? And then 250 leaders respected leaders, leaders with authority, packed out, staring at these two, what in the world is Moses gonna do? Could you imagine being up here and everybody in the congregation saying, hey, no, 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 get, get off of there, who do you think you are? I mean, Moses was in a, a pickle. So what's he gonna do? If 
fall on his face, basically deferring to God, what can he do? So we found, fine, in verse four, so when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. Now, the man Moses, according to Numbers 12, verse three, says, the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. And he was the leader, but who was really the leader of Israel? Moses or God? Now, for someone to be an ambassador, basically he speaks from the authority of the one he's representing it, right? And so a good ambassador doesn't add to or take away from what the leader has said, right? Now, it's understandable that you go into a different language, you have to interpret, you, do you do your dead level best to interpret the intent of what the leader says? That's the responsibility of an ambassador. And so, when they said, Moses, uh, why do you exalt yourself? Why, why do you put yourself in, uh, in front? But who delivered Egypt, delivered the, Israel from Egypt? It was God using Moses. Who made the crossing of the Red Sea possible? It was God using Moses. Who has been feeding Israel? It's been God. And so we read in verse five, and he, Moses, spoke to Korah and all his company saying, tomorrow morning, the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will cause him to come near to him that one whom he chooses, he will cause to come near to him. Do this, and I think this tongue in cheek, do this, take censers, Korah, and all your company, put fire in them, put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the Holy One. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. Basically, Moses is saying, okay, guys, go ahead and do what you are demanding and longing for. I can't stop you. But they should have been struck with fear at the absurdity of the suggestion of Moses. Because they knew they had the knowledge in their head that that was the responsibility of the priest. Dare they violate the word of God? Evidently, they didn't think of it that way. Verse eight, then Moses said to Korah, hear now, you sons of Levi. Is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, to stand before the congregation to serve them, and, and, and that he had brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi with you. Are you seeking the priesthood also? Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what, what is Aaron that you complain about him? The Levites already had a privileged position in serving God and the people. Kor especially had honor being a head and leader of his large family in God's service. It says in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, now godliness with contentment is great gain. Cora, you've got a lot to thank God for. Be content. The warning from Moses that they had gathered against the Lord should have also brought shivers up their spine. They really need to consider, seriously consider, what they're saying in light of what they knew God has already said through Moses. Then Moses goes to find Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, but they said, we won't come up. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of the land flowing with milk and honey? Egypt, land flowing with milk and honey? How much of that did you get when you were enslaved? Come on now, guys. Guys. 
to kill us in the wilderness? That you should keep acting like a prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us to the land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Now, if you read in the book of Numbers, in the earlier chapters, it's the story or the account of sending the 12 spies, one representative from each tribe, into the promised land to take a look and come back with a report. What do you see? So they went, fantastic. I mean, they had this thing of grapes, took two men to carry it, good gracious. The, the, the place was fantastic, just what God had said, land flowing with milk and honey. But there were some giants. There are some walled cities. And so we find Caleb and Joshua said, God can take them. It's ready, let's go. And then 10 of us said, no, 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 no. Wait, 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 the giant's there. And, and we were so insignificant that we were kind of like grasshoppers, you know, in front of them. And we can't do it, we can't do it, we can't do it. And Joshua and Caleb said, well, God can. We can't, God can. Let's go, let's go. And you know, it boiled up into a fever to the pitch that they're ready to kill Moses over this issue. And God said, okay, okay, don't go, don't go. Then he said, because of your lack of faith, lack of trust in me, and after all that you've seen, those of you who are 20 years old or older will die in the wilderness and your children will go into the promised land. You have seen all these marvelous things and you're saying, no, 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 no. So here we find that uh, Dath and Abiram are ignoring that and they want now, I want to want now, it's gonna come. But those who said no, God took the no. That's the way it is. And then verse 15. Moses was very angry and said to the Lord, do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them. I don't know why he's using the word donkey, but I mean, didn't they take one donkey? Nor have I hurt one of them. And Moses said to Korah, tomorrow, you and all your company be present before the Lord, you and they as well as Aaron. And I think it's interesting that they have a whole day to rethink their actions tomorrow? Are they going to re reconsider? In light of what they already knew, God had said to them through Moses. And so the next day comes, verse 17. Let each take his censer and put incense in it. And each of you bring his censer before the Lord, 250 censers. You know, if that there's less than 200 people here, so if we all had censers, that'd be a lot of smoke going up. But God has already said only the priests, only the priests are to do that. So every man took his sense to put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle meeting with Moses and Aaron. And I would suspect that the men were finding delight as they prepared to make incense before the Lord. Something, you know, I have never done this before. I've always wanted to. But God said, that's not your part. That's not your thing. They should have had a chill of fear come up their spine to do something in rebellion against God. They ignored that. Verse 19. And Kor gathered, whoa. Kor gathered all the congregation. Now, he, he collected these 250 representatives, powerful people. Now he's got the whole crowd gathered at the, uh, at the door of the tabernacle meet, of meeting against Moses. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. And here comes a test for Moses and Aaron. 
And actually, this is a test that they've already had. It says in verse 20, And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourself from among the congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. Bang, he was on his face again. He said, oh God, oh God, the God of, of the spirits and of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation? Moses had a right to be angry, but he retained a loving compassion for the people who were severely at odds with God and himself. And he was providing an example of Jesus and the heart of Jesus full of compassion, Jesus who was yet to come. In Moses, okay, from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, Moses was speaking to the congregation at a different setting. He says, the Lord God, the Lord your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses, from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. And Peter in um, Acts, when he is speaking to the crowds following the resurrection of Jesus Christ, encouraging people to trust in Jesus Christ, quotes from this. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet, Jesus, like me, Moses, from your brethren, him, Jesus, you shall hear in all things and whatever he, Jesus, says to you. And Stephen, in his defense, we read in Acts 7, verse 37, this is the Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. So we see justice of God mercy of God. And Moses was taking this place as Jesus has taken, pleading for mercy and grace. And so we read in verse 23, so the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the congregation saying, get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation saying, depart now from the tents of these wicked, me wicked men. T touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents and their wives, their sons, their little children. Note, God said, get away from the tents. He didn't get to say, get away from Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. He didn't say that. He said, get away from the tents. So leaving the tents would be a sign of what? Repentance, changing the mind. So rather than saying, I repent, it means move those legs, get out of there, leave the tents. So they had that moment to respond. You might say, so close to, to judgment. Move. And we find a little bit later on that the children of Korah did that. They ran from their parents' tents and they were saved. And then verse 28, Moses said, by this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works for I have not done them of my own will. So like Christ. Christ made it very clear. Everything he did was in agreement with the Father. He gave his will 100% to the Father. He did not speak of his own desires. He spoke of the will of God. In verse 29, if these men die naturally like all men, they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them with all that belongs to them and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand these men have rejected the Lord. 
the rebellious, persistent, and hi- attempting to hijack God's place, uh-uh, God responds. Now it came to pass as he finished speaking all these words that the ground split apart under them and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with core and all their goods. So they and those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them and they perished from among the assembly. Then all of Israel around them fled at the cry. They said, lest the earth swallow us up also. And fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 253 men who were offering incense. The danger of jealousy, envy, pride. The danger of not heeding God and his word. (coughs) Then the Lord spoke, this is verse 36, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, tell Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, to pick up the censers out of the blaze, for they are holy, and scatter the fire some distance away. The censer of these men who sinned against their own souls Let them be made into hammered plates as a covering for the altar. Because they presented them before the Lord, therefore they are holy, and they shall be a sign to the children of Israel. So Eleazar the priest took the bronze censers, which those who were burned up had presented, and they were hammered out as a covering for the altar, to to be a memorial to the children of Israel, that no outsider who is not a descendant of Aaron, should come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he may not become like Korah and his companions, just as the Lord had said to them through Moses. All Israel witnessed this, those horrible events that transpired. So what lesson did they learn? Verse 41, and the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. Where their minds, the cloud showing the presence of the Lord was there. Were they thinking that somehow Moses can manipulate God? Or somehow they had supernatural powers? What in the world are they thinking? And so we read verse 42. Now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron that they turned toward the tabernacle of meeting and suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, get away from among the congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And guess what Moses did? Once again, falls on his face. In petition of grace and mercy. So Moses said to Aaron, take a censer, put fire in it from the altar, put incense on it, take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them, for wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. Go, go, go. Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly, and already the plague had begun among the people. So he put in the incense and made atonement for the people and he stood between the dead and the living. So the plague stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700 besides those who died in the Korah incident. So Aaron returned to Moses at the door of the tabernacle of meeting for the plague has stopped even after so many evidences of God's direct and personal involvement, 
they were not conscious of God's presence or really knew who he is. They had failed to recognize the obvious, marvelous workings of God in the past and his daily provisions in the present. We too, we too, fail to see God as he is and hear his words through the scriptures. God had a special purpose for Israel. He was going to use Israel for his glory to bless the world. And God intends to work in your life, in my life, for his purposes, which would bless the world. In Romans 12.1, you know this, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And tack that on with 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you're not your own, but you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirits, which are God's. That's not the end of the story that we just read. In Numbers chapter 26, verse 9 through 11, it says, The son of Eliab were Nimuel, Dathan, and Abiram. These are the Dathan and Abiram representatives of the congregation who contended against Moses and Aaron in the company of Korah when they contended against the Lord. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up together with Korah when that company died. Then the fire devoured 250 men, and they became a sign. Nevertheless, the children of Korah did not die. The sons, children of Korah, left the tent of their parents and sided with God. What a traumatic decision those kids had to make. What a price they paid. But you know, there is a psalm. It's kind of like a memorial to these kids. It's found in Psalm 84, where it says, the chief musician on an instrument of Gath, a psalm of the sons of Korah, begins this way. How lovely, how lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart, my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King, my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, they're still praising you. Selah, think about it. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage as they, fast, as they pass through the valley of Baca. The word Baca means weeping or crying. As they pass through the valley of tears, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from from strength to, to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Selah, think about it. O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is, is better than a thousand. I, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from, from those who walk uprightly. 
O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. My Father, as I think about these young people who had to make a decision to reject you or to run away from what they knew was evil. Lord, I pray for myself and each of us here that we would treasure our relationship with you. We will begin to know you as you really are. Have that awareness that you are present everywhere. And how is it, Lord, it's possible to imagine that we who have trusted in you and dwelt with the Spirit of God, Lord, may the meditations of our hearts and the words of our mouths, our mouths be acceptable in your sight, I pray. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.